A very good morning to you, ladies and gentlemen, those of you who are joining us on television and online. You're very welcome to this virtual dialogue on the role of the media in the electoral process during a pandemic. And this is jointly brought to you by the Ministry of ICT and National Guidance and the Embassy of Sweden here in Uganda. We want to thank you so much for joining us. And you can join this conversation using the hashtag DemocracyTalksUG. You can also join this conversation on all our platforms, including Zoom, but also Facebook, uh, the Facebook account of NTV Uganda, the Facebook account of UBC, and the Facebook account of the Ministry of ICT and National Guidance. This conversation will be brought to you virtually because of what we are all fa facing currently, the COVID pandemic, and uh, the current challenge of the pandemic facing Uganda and the rest of the world. It's important to reflect on what it means for democracy and human rights. Now, more than ever, it's important for citizens to be able to participate in decision-making because many of the decisions that have been made affect them very concretely and personally. And this, this uh, Democracy Talks, is part of the series organized by the Embassy of Sweden um, to allow for that conversation to happen uh, virtually, which is online and, of course, on the different uh, social media platforms and the traditional media platforms like television and radio. So we want to welcome you all. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Maurice Mugisha, and this is being broadcast live on UBC TV and NTV. To give us welcome remarks, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to invite uh, the Honorable Minister, the Honorable Judith Nabakova, the Minister of ICT and National Guidance, to welcome us. You're most welcome, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Maurice, once again. Your Excellence, the Ambassador of Sweden, the PS, Minister of ICT and National Guidance, our dear panelists, members of the press, the general public, ladies and gentlemen who are watching us, who are following us, I once again welcome you to this dialogue. I would like to thank you in your respective roles for ensuring that this virtual engagement takes place. As you are aware, the media plays a vital role in democratization in general and the electoral process in particular. The media not only informs and educates but also contributes to democracy by offering a platform for public discourse. Today, Uganda, like the other countries, we are grappling with COVID-19. It is highly a contagious disease. Without a direct cure or vaccine, this means that the most viable option for us as Ugandans is to follow the standard operating procedures as guided by the Minister of Health and His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Uganda, General Yoel Kaguta Museveni. With the COVID-19 threat still in our midst, we have opted for a virtual approach to fulfill our constitutional obligation of holding the 2021 general elections. This means that there will be minimum or no interaction between the candidates and voters. This time around, it means the political actors are now required to mobilize voters using media platforms. The media is therefore set to play an important role in the electoral process than ever before. It will be an opportunity for the media because you are going to be better positioned to shape the political direction of the country, but it also appears a challenge because with the high stakes, the media, you are going to be under scrutiny from most of the stakeholders. Government through the Ministry of ICT pledges to create an environment 
which is free, vibrant, and responsible for the media throughout this virtual electoral process. This means that the media ought to be fair, balanced, factual, nonpartisan, and professional while doing your work. The media ought to provide facts that help the electorate to participate and vote from an informed point of view. Since poll process can be a little tense, we expect the media to avoid sensationalism. And I think as a ministry, we have been briefing you about the standard minimum broadcasting requirements. The UCC and the Media Council have also been playing their role of engaging the media houses, but also journalists on the professional code of conduct. It is paramount that candidates and parties are accorded equitable coverage. Media personnel should also remain alert. You are expected to remain alert to your journalistic code of ethics since there is a high likelihood that some political actors can attempt to compromise you in one way or another. I'm aware that the Media Council and UCC are continuing to engage you with your, with, are continuing to engage with journalists so that we minimize deviancy from the regulatory requirements as much as possible. I am therefore optimistic that the media will play a pivotal, a pivotal role and constructive, and constructive role during the 2021 general elections. And as a ministry, I want to confirm once again that we are committed to support you in whatever way to enable you deliver this election because this is the first time in the history of Uganda that the media you are at the center of these general elections. We expect you to do your work professionally, but also help the different candidates air out their manifestos in a manner which is not sensational and which is not against the minimum broadcasting standards. With those few remarks, once again, I welcome you to, for, to this engagement. And I also wish you fruitful deliberations throughout the dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. And uh, we will quickly now move to remarks by the Ambassador of Sweden to Uganda on the drive for democracy, His Excellency Pierre Lingard. Honorable Minister for ICT and the National Guidance, the Permanent Secretary from the same uh, ministry, representatives from the media fraternity, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Let me start by uh, thanking you all for uh, joining us here today to discuss the important role of the media in electoral processes during a pandemic. Particularly, I would like to thank the minister and uh, your team for uh, spearheading the organization of this very important uh, dialogue. The COVID-19 pandemic has uh, changed the way in which we conduct our lives. More emphasis has been placed on ensuring the health of society, which comes at the expense of physical interaction. The pandemic has taught us to rely more on technology for communication, which has become challenging for those with poor access. As we move towards Uganda's national elections in the beginning of next year, a high importance has been placed on the media 
as a tool to inform citizens and educate them about their civic duty. With the media in Uganda expected to be the primary source of information for the electorate, it has become increasingly important for the, for the media to provide fair, accurate, timely, and comprehensive election-related information. Today's dialogue aims to discuss the central role that the media shall play in protecting Uganda's democracy. The use of media to communicate effectively and ensure equal access for all political actors is, I believe, key to protecting Uganda's democratic processes. This dialogue that we are having today is part of Sweden's foreign policy initiative known as the Drive for Democracy, in which a series of dialogues termed as Democracy Talks are held around the world with the aim of discussing how governments and citizens interact to strengthen democracy. We believe that democracy enables people to make their voices heard and gives them the right to influence and demand accountability. Democracy also provides hope and the conditions to shape a common future in a safe and peaceful society. Democratic values, values are being threatened and opportunities for citizen participation in decision making are weakening in many countries. This trend has been further compounded by the COVID-19 pandemic. We must ensure that actions to combat the COVID-19 pandemic do not undermine democracy or its institutions. I hope that this dialogue also contributes to the international discussion on what effects the pandemic has on democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. According to the reports Without Borders, Uganda's press freedom has declined in the recent years from position 97 in 2015 to 125 in 2019. Press freedom needs to be protected, especially considering how important the role of media is in the upcoming elections. It is therefore important now to ensure that the media is supported to play its role to mobilize citizens towards progressive actions that increase their participation in decision making. Globally, Sweden aims to tackle the challenges of democratic decline and shrinking democratic space by encouraging public conversations on issues that affect the public. We hope to strengthen free and independent media and the voices of democracy, especially on the internet, to be useful tools that promote universal democratic values. 250 years ago, Sweden became the first country in the world to have freedom of the press written into its constitution. Today, Sweden's priority is to be a strong and clear voice in defense of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. We stand firm in supporting and strengthening civil society, reducing inequalities, and respecting freedom of expression and access to information. During the COVID-19 pandemic, it is important to ensure transparency, and access to reliable information. A citizen's right to health not only depends on access accessible health care, but also on the possibilities for them to stay well informed. Freedom of expression and free and independent media 
are closely related to this and are just as important. So is the need to counter misinformation and disinformation, especially in times of elections. Lastly, but not least, I would like to highlight the importance of gender balanced reporting. While ideally the media should strive for accuracy and impartiality, in reality, there are often imbalances in coverage, including in terms of women and uh, their perspectives. Women politicians, for example, may be underrepresented in news before and during the electoral process. We would like to encourage the media to provide an open platform for broader public deliberation for women and youth, particularly during this election period. Our hope is that this dialogue sheds light on the important role that the media continues to play in protecting Uganda's democracy. Sweden remains committed to strengthen democracy in Uganda and around the world through our development support and in initiatives such as these. I hope that these discussions are fruitful and help deliver a stronger democratic process for all Ugandans. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll now uh, quickly move into our very first panel discussion. And uh, since we are social distancing, and I must mention that we are coming to you live from the Ministry of ICT and National Guidance Offices here in Kampala, in their information center. And uh, this is not a hotel. We are literally in the ministry. And uh, we want to thank the ministry for hosting us. And while at that, we assured all our panelists and guests are equally socially distanced. And so now, you'll allow me to uh, let the minister and our uh, ambassador uh, make their way to the viewing room so that we then can create a space for our panelists. And they will be back um, when they are closing. And they will be with us because they will be watching. Uh, they will be watching us uh, online. And uh, they will be following the conversation as it continues. So thank you very much, Honorable Minister, and Your Excellency. Um, you, you can make your way. Uh, the team will guide you. All right. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, we'll move to the first panel discussion that we have, which will literally set the stage for our conversation on the role of media in the electoral process during a pandemic. So allow me to invite our guests and uh, the other panelists to join us. Um, with us is uh, the Executive Director of Africa Center for Media Excellence, uh, ACME. Uh, Peter Mwesige, thank you so much for joining us. Peter, also joining us, uh, please do take your seats, uh, is uh, Abdul Salam Waiswa. Abdul Salam Waiswa is a legal advisor at the UCC, and uh, he'll definitely take us through his full title um, at the UCC. And also with us is Paul Bukenya, the spokesperson, Electoral Commission. I want to welcome you all, gentlemen. Um, I know there will be a couple of people online saying uh, we, we are not... Uh, observing the gender parity issue, uh, but that's a conversation for another day. Um, both, all three gentlemen will be speaking to us um, on the role of media in this electoral process. And I wanted to begin with Peter, because, um, please use that microphone, Peter. Um, I want to begin with you because you will be speaking to us on media guidelines and the code of conduct in election reporting. Please, Peter. Thank you, Maurice. I'll remove my mask uh, and put it in an envelope. Save uh, Paul from. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you for the invitation uh, the ministry, to the ministry and uh, the embassy of Sweden. Uh, before I talk about the guidelines, I wanted to first uh, again try to help put this in context. I think both the minister and the ambassador have talked about the role of the media in elections or in a democracy. And the key things I think we take is that the media shine or should shine a spotlight on the whole process, you know, right from the regulations to the primaries of the parties, the laws to the campaigns, the declaration of results, the petitions and the swearing in, 
and all that. But in particular, the media should provide accurate information to help voters uh, make informed decisions. The media also provide a platform for, for debate of differing viewpoints. And these two are related. You can't have uh, adequate information if there is no debate about uh, what's going on, you know, uh, in the political system. The media also hold or should hold candidates, parties, the other players like donors, and even the regulators like the electoral commission accountable, you know. Are they doing what they're supposed to be doing? Are they doing it fairly? And so on and so forth. And maybe finally I could say the media help us from time to time to gauge public opinion. Now, uh, we have, since the previous elections of 2011, uh, issued guidelines on media coverage of elections. Uh, previously, we were supported by uh, what was called the Deepening Democracy Program. Uh, in the last uh, elections, we were supported by uh, the, the Democratic Governance Facility. And in this election, too, we have been supported by the same uh, organization to uh, basically come up with, uh, among other things, uh, a reference point that can help journalists, you know, uh, improve their reporting on elections. But the thing I want to emphasize now, uh, Maurice and my colleagues, is that uh, these guidelines are not just meant for the media. They are also meant for the political parties, the candidates, the electoral commission, the regulators, because uh, you can, and the citizens as well, they can be used as a reference point to hold the media accountable. So I'll just read for you very quickly a few of uh, the things that uh, we have in the guidelines. We talk about provision of information, balance and fairness, independence, accuracy, sourcing, uh, the minister just talked about uh, the, the importance of uh, gender balance, no, the ambassador rather, uh, corrections and replies, opinions, polls, uh, equity and consistency, particularly for uh, public broadcasters, we shall come back to that issue, electoral violence, political advertising, and as you all know, this year is going to be a very big issue because of uh, the so-called media-only campaigns, discrimination, bribery and corruption, conflict of interest, and generally the full coverage of the electoral process. Uh, we also have special provisions for the state broadcaster, the national broadcaster, as some call it, UBC, and as you all know, UBC is enjoined by law to give uh, equitable coverage to all candidates. It has featured in previous challenges to the election of uh, President Museveni. And uh, as you all know, that new law, Presidential Elections Amendment Act, actually uh, makes it an offense if uh, the state broadcaster and other public broadcasters do not uh, offer equitable coverage to candidates. So, like I've said before, uh, I'm hoping that uh, the public can check out these guidelines on our website, civil society, the parties, regulators, so that uh, we can also hold the media accountable to these standards that they have all agreed to. Now, the other thing I want to mention uh, very quickly that is, I think, important for the discussion is uh, the context within which these elections are happening. It is very important for journalists to ask the right questions, you know, about this context and they can ask so, um, a whole manner of questions about uh, the electoral commission for instance because my good friend paul is here so i should say the electoral commission you know how is their integrity mm -hmm. eh? is the roadmap ready is it being followed eh? have they received the necessary funding how are their logistical preparations there are a whole number of questions they can ask they need to continuously offer the public the kind of context that they need to make sense of this process, not simply regurgitating what candidates or parties say at rallies or in their you know, radio and broadcaster programs. They also need to look at the laws. Are they in place? Are they fair? Are there any calls for reforms? You have had this big problem forever. You know, you remember that the Supreme Court uh, did ask uh, the Attorney General to come back to Parliament and uh, you know, ensure that uh, some of those issues that have uh, bedeviled us for the last uh, you know, so many years are addressed by Parliament. Have they been addressed? How is the actual implementation of some of these laws and regulations and uh, so on? Are the candidates able to campaign freely? It really bothers me that we talk about uh, a media-only campaign at a time when the opposition candidates continue to face enormous pressure from RDCs and the police when they try to appear on talk shows. 
you know, are the media providing a spotlight on those issues? Are the regulators actually speaking out on those issues? I have been told by friends from the EC that they are waiting for the actual, uh, the kick off of the, ca the campaigns uh, for, the, for them to follow, you know, some of these regulations. But I think it's important that we all pay attention to the fairness of this process, including the fairness of uh, media coverage. Who is appearing on media? Who is it appearing on media? And perhaps at this point, I should also mention that uh, we have been, um, you know, uh, for, for the last so many years, we have uh, had a situation of uh, media, media being owned by uh, politicians, mm -hmm. and especially those from the ruling party. It's going to be a very big issue this year. Are these people going to be able to respect, you know, the requirements for equitable treatment of their, you know, uh, of, of all candidates, including those who oppose the NRM or those who oppose them in case some of the owners are actually standing in the elections. These are issues that should be part of the public debate. These are issues, that, uh, you know, on which we should hold all parties uh, accountable. Uh, I know that uh, the media only campaign has been music to the ears of uh, our friends in the sales and marketing departments of the industry who have been, of course, uh, you know, battling with uh, uh, the negative effects of COVID-19 on saturation, on advertising, and so on. Uh, but we are hoping that uh, political advertising, which they are gearing up to, will still follow ethical guidelines that are out there. In particular, we are hoping that political advertising and paid pro programs are going to be clearly labeled. When I switch on TV at all times, I should be able to know that that is a political ad and it has been paid for by the NRM or by candidate Museveni or by the SJ or, or Bobby Wine or whoever it is who is you know, sponsoring these candidates. You know? uh, and we need to do this you know, because I've seen uh, in some cases people, some media houses only show us at the end of the program or the beginning of the program. It should be for the duration of the whole program. People should be, because people tune in at different times, they should be able to know, you know what? This is a paid for program. This is not something that NTV or UBC chose because of its newsworthiness. They chose it because it has been paid for, okay? Uh, we are also hoping that the media won't compromise their public interest mission for the sake of the, you know, the shilling, you know? Uh, how can they balance between uh, making money, which is a legitimate, you know, uh, thing, and also offering the public the information they need to make sense of what is going on. We are hoping that NTV, UBC, NBS, and all the other media houses are not going to end up filling all their daily, you know, I mean, hours with uh, paid for programs, you know, and deny the public the kind of interrogative, analytical reporting that the media requires of uh, democracy. Uh, regulations uh, also require that uh, political parties uh, who pay for paid for programs are given uh, equal opportunity if they so wish. So should you host uh, the NRM or candidate Museveni and Bobby Wine chooses to come to UBC, you are required by law to give Bobby Wine equal time as long as it is reasonable, as long as he's coming to you within a week for instance, not after two months or something like that. Are we able to do that? And these are things which we are all protected. I know that we have colleagues in the media who are worried that, uh, you know, they, their jobs could be at stake if they offer the opposition a platform and so on and so forth. I can guarantee you, even if you are fired, according to the law, at least the way I understand it, they would have no grounds. You would sue and probably become richer than you ever <laughs> imagined. So, so please stand your ground and speak truth to power. Be fair to all. Uh, the media also at this point have a responsibility to debunk the misinformation that is uh, especially being churned out by social media. It is the primary responsibility for the media to uh, tell the public about uh, some of these issues. You see clips, you see on uh, social media and so on and so, on and so forth. I think uh, finally, uh, I want to talk about COVID-19. As you all know, uh, this campaign has come at a time when uh, we are battling uh, 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 the biggest, you know, pandemic of our time, our time, those of us who are young. Eh? Now, are the media continuing to focus on how politicians and the parties and those players are respecting these guidelines? Or are we simply portraying their, you know, words without paying attention to how they follow the measures the government has put in place? When they have mini rallies or meetings and all that, do we continue flagging the fact that they are violating social distancing rules, 
wearing of masks and so on and so forth. Do we do that? I think we need to continue mentioning the fact that many of these politicians are not doing that. Let us not normalize what is really very threatening for all of Uganda. The media's role in elections has never been more important. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter Mwesige. Uh, you literally have set uh, the ball rolling in this conversation uh, because uh, listening to both the minister and also uh, the ambassador of Sweden to Uganda, it is very clear that uh, never before will the media have a center stage than this year uh, or the next few months uh, as we head up into the elections. And one particular body uh, that is responsible in regulating the media is the UCC. And uh, with us, of course, is uh, Abdu. Uh, Abdu, I wanted you to take us through the media regulation and reporting uh, in the times of a pandemic. Uh, I know you have developed guidelines for reporting uh, on the elections, and uh, you've sh shared with stakeholders. But you want to share with us highlights of that uh, while you speak to some of the issues I know uh, Peter raised. Thank you very much, Morris. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are very much grateful for this opportunity to come and participate in this dialogue where we get to interface with the media players but also inform the public about the roles we play in this rather difficult period. Uh, my name is again Abdul Salam Waiswa. I work as the head legal and compliance at the Uganda Communications Commission. For those of you who may not be aware, Uganda Communications Commission is the government body that was set up by the Uganda Communications Act of 2013 as a converged regulator of communication services in Uganda. UCC oversees uh, the work of the media because most of the media activities fall within the broad category of broadcasting and data communication. Indeed, UCC has always been ready to ensure that uh, media services and communication services are enjoyed by the public but also provided in a safe and responsible manner. Uganda Communications Commission is guided by its actions by the Uganda Communications Act and the several regulations made under that law. And specifically for the media, there is a section 31 that we many times refer to as a section on minimum broadcasting standards. This section has always been in the law and primarily it reminds all broadcasters to ensure that whenever they are doing their work, they adhere to the minimum values and standards of a broadcaster. And these are well articulated, again, in Schedule 4 of the Uganda Communications Act. Uh, sometimes people have debated, are these standards there? Are they hidden? Do the journalists know about these standards? I want to invite the public to please look at the Uganda Communications Act, Schedule 4 of that act lists all these standards. For purposes of this discussion, I'll pick up one of the standards in there, says that when you are covering anything or reporting about a contender for a public office, a political office, you must ensure that in your broadcast, you give all other candidates or political players equal opportunity to articulate their issues and also share their opinions. This is very much important because we are entering into an area where many politicians will be looking for space where they can relay their messages to the public. And indeed, um, Dr. Mwesige was mentioning that this is one of the core uh, values that we must give to the politicians and the nation. If as a, med as, a, as, as a media industry, if we cannot accord all players the opportunity to explain what they are going to do to the public, then they will not be able to popularize the ideas. But most importantly, with or without elections, media providers, broadcasters specifically, have license terms and conditions. And these have always been available. They commit them to adhere to certain values. One of them is factual reporting and not broadcasting content that can be seen to be insightful or spreading lies or misinforming the public. We know very well that traditionally our politicians have been appearing on campaigns, at their rallies, and they would speak all manner of words against each other. During this period where campaigns are going to be on radio, on TV, 
we call upon all media players, the journalists, to ensure that they, they remain accountable to the regulator, but the nation, and they must always observe the minimum broadcasting standards, which require them to be professional, to be accurate, to be balanced. Uh, also, in 2019, even before COVID became an issue in the world, the Minister of ICT, in accordance with the, the mandate under the Uganda Communications Act, developed a number of regulations. Among these regulations are what we call the Uganda Communications Content Regulations of 2019. These regulations are detailed in what a broadcaster should do during times of elections and political campaigns. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you again to look at those regulations because, for example, they provide that uh, during election, the media must try as much as possible to accord all participants in the electoral process time to disseminate their information and their messages to the public. The law further goes on to say that you can even allow political advertisement. And political adv advertisement is basically any program that a broadcaster comes up with for purposes of popularizing any political candidate. It could be an independent person, it could be a political party. So the media is allowed to take on political advertisement. And indeed, whereas for other general broadcasting on elections, media is supposed to accord everybody the opportunity. For political advertisement, the House is not obliged to take the advert, but if it chooses to take an advert for, from one of the political contenders, then that triggers an obligation on the, on the part of the media house to accord other politicians an equal opportunity on the same terms and conditions as what was provided to the other po politician. So it is very much important to always know that, okay, if you've given one political party chance to come and advertise on your TV or on your radio, when another one knocks at your door, you have no right as a media house to say, I will not carry you. Of course, we expect reasonable negotiations between you, such as the politician doesn't just wake up one morning, comes at your studio and says, I want to appear on your TV. No, 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 no. We expect due notice. Mm -hmm. Notify the media house that I also intend to use your services at such and such a time. Negotiate. UCC has further worked on guidelines, which indeed, like Morris mentioned, we've shared with the media houses. And in these, we are guiding that when you are pricing the cost of political advertisement, try to use the minimum cost available for such programs. The intention is for us to avoid extortion. We know media players have struggled during the pandemic, but everybody has struggled. So we are calling upon the media to ensure do you do not use this opportunity to again disadvantage our colleagues in political campaigns. Charge them the minimum fee chargeable for such services. And then it is also important, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, as we entertain politicians in our shows on radio and TVs, let us try to play our role as broadcasters. Because unlike the campaigns in a field or a yard where there is no clear regulation except for the electoral rolls, for media-based campaigns, we expect the radio station or TV station to have a professional moderator who will be able to manage the views and opinions of the politicians. Do not allow your media platform to be used by one politician to attack and character assassinate the other person. That is not acceptable. Under the electoral laws, it's not acceptable, but also under the minimum broadcasting standards, it is also not acceptable. And indeed, the UCC has a mechanism to ensure that all broadcasters abide by these terms and conditions. And then one point that has been raised here has been uh, many of the broadcasters are owned by politicians. It's actually not true that most of our broadcasters are owned by politicians. Uh, of the 321 radio stations in the country, the number that is owned by politicians is very minimal, less than 30 percent. Most of the broadcasters are owned by individuals, um, I mean by private people there, religious institutions, not necessarily politicians. But the, beauty, the good thing about it all, it does not matter who owns the media house. Once you get a license as a broadcaster, you acquire a public obligation. That media license is not a license for you to begin abusing other people because you are the owner of the TV or the radio, and then also begin excluding your opponents. 
In fact, we call upon all media players, all owners of media houses, even if your opponent, uh, even if you are standing with somebody in your constituents and you own a radio station in that constituents, if that opponent approaches your media house and requests for time on your radio or TV, if you subject them to prejudice by maybe denying them the opportunity or overpricing the cost, I mean the, ch the cost of the, the programming, that will be a breach of the law and your license terms and conditions. And under the UCC regulatory framework, there are mechanisms to reprimand you, including fining you, suspending the program, but also taking on other, even harder uh, uh, modes of sanction. So we call upon all media players to respect these rules. The rules are known. The guidelines are, are being shared with you. Let us respect each other. Because you know many times when UCC takes action, the media and the civil society is very quick to say UCC is gagging the media. UCC's role is not to gag anybody. In fact, we wake up every day to come up with policies that facilitate the enjoyment of media space in Uganda. So let us work together as partners. UCC cannot achieve this responsible, accountable media industry in Uganda without the cooperation of the journalists, of the media, and the public. And then lastly, I call upon the public to be vigilant. When you notice that a particular media house is breaching the law or the standards, please do not keep quiet. You have a right to complain to UCC where the complaint relates to communication services. But during election time, under the electoral laws, electoral commission is the primary body that is supposed to arbitrate complaints regarding political uh, party activities. So again, UCC will continue working with electoral commission, working with other agencies of government to ensure that any breach during this period is properly addressed within the legal framework to ensure that as a country, we get a legitimate election, an election that we shall all be proud of for having been fair, reasonable, and well conducted. And this is important because we are all Ugandans. We must work every day to protect this country against bad programming, against bad campaigning strategies, and ensure that we all progress as a Uganda for God and my country. Thank you very much, Abdul. Um, Abdul, I'll, I'm hoping time allows I'll come back to you because there's some things that uh, have been uh, trending on social media, one including your new guidelines on uh, digital communication or social media communication, uh, especially uh, for anybody who uh, is broadcasting content on, on, on social media. Uh, secondly is the conversation on penetration, uh, radio and television penetration, and why it's going to be very critical um, to know how that uh, the, these platforms perform in terms of uh, providing uh, effective communication or at least platforms for the politicians to reach their people. Uh, and I think finally, the cost of data. Uh, but that's uh, you know, a broader conversation. We could come to that. I want to come to uh, Paul Bukenya uh, from the Electoral Commission, who will be taking us through the role of the media and elections. Uh, Paul, you're at the center stage of this conversation. And uh, unlike any other election you have handled as Electoral Commission, this is a Minister pandemic, and your Go, not, I, I, you know, if using football terms, your rules of engagement have changed. Sure, uh, sure Maurice, thanks, and uh, I think uh, the dear panelists and our audience. Yeah, we are conducting the 2021 elections, which have actually already started, in uh, situations that require us to change the way we've been doing certain electoral activities. And this stretches also into the, you know, campaign activities and, and uh, all the rest of the activities coming to the actual polling on polling day. So uh, um, COVID has occasioned changes in many areas and we will operate. And uh, we have come out to guide on how to conduct activities in a safe manner. So, uh, but to start it all, the traditional roles of media will remain to, to inform and to educate. They will remain critical. In a times of pandemic like we are, uh, the attention of the public really goes even higher in the media because now the media becomes a trusted source. They said it on the radio, the, the president made the statement on the radio, it came out in the, fig the figures came out in the press. So uh, the, the, there is a tendency for, uh, you know, trust to, to well, probably <laughs> you could look at it uh, differently, but of course attention goes higher. The media is the source. They're out there to pick the information and bring it to us. We can't go out the way we used to. 
So uh, COVID-19, therefore, and its effects should remain a key attention of the media in, in whatever they are doing, and uh, the editorial policy should not drop that story. That now we know what's going on, we, we, don't, we need to take it off uh, our, uh, our main radar. Uh, similarly, it comes into elections. We are saying as electoral commission that the media is going to be a very key player in promoting safe participation in the electoral process. Because the, there is a COVID-19 around us and there's concern, uh, can we really go out and participate in electoral activity? Can we go out and line up, uh, you know, with social distancing and all? Is it possible to conduct the election in a, a COVID environment? Uh, the media will be very key in partnering with the electoral commission and promoting safe participation with various stakeholders. So when we send out an invite to, to, to have those young people come and work as temporary election officials, uh, th th they will ask questions. Is it safe? Is it going to be safe for me? Will I come back? Like if I go to a polling station, won't I contract the, the COVID-19 and, and all that? So um, the media can do this through promoting the, the, the approaches we have proposed as the electoral commission. Uh, we have proposed approaches and uh, SOPs that can actually enable us to conduct electoral activities in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, and I would like to quickly probably go through them. For example, the media should promote the regulated meetings approach, and uh, we can, candidates can have regulated meetings because we will provide it for that, where the, 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 the are SOPs and you're in a place which is where you, when you convene a place, you can determine the number of people who can get there, and there's an entry point where you can even register persons coming in, or even if you've not registered, they can wash their hands if they come in, a jerry can of water and bow soap, and then uh, they have put on masks. The, the media can help us into that. So in regulated meetings involve manageable numbers of people, as opposed to doing a procession and collecting whoever uh, sees the, the caravan and joins you, and then you end up at, uh, at the bomber grounds, and you do not know who is there. E everyone has come to the, to the meeting. So probably the media should consider to make it as part of their editorial policy to review how they assess the strength of a candidate. Uh, is it in numerical? We move from the numerical to the, the public interest, to the responsible candidate who protects the, the, the population as opposed to the reckless candidate who just gets everyone together uh, and, uh, you know, wants to push the numbers uh, uh, and to show their strength. Maybe these are questions that could, could, could come out. You know, you want that front picture to have a very big the mammoth crowd. Is it time to continue with the mammoth crowd theory or approach? Or, or we will promote uh, Morris who has opted for, you know, town hall meetings that are regulated and still portray them as candidates who are, uh, you, know, you know, credible and they're doing the right thing. So uh, um, I think media could take take it up as part of acting in public interest, like, like Simia has said, Peter. So media will play a role also in uh, demystifying. You know, media needs to demystify itself. People have said elections are going to be media-based, and everyone is wondering what is media, uh, because media is both loved and, and feared. Some people are, are shy. They can't go in the media. So media, I think, has to, to, to reach out and, and bring this down to the people, because uh, probably there is a, a, a lot that is still mysterious about it. But this is what we've said. Uh, we said. We also know vulnerable groups that have been already told you, you will not be able to participate in this election because it's media-based. Uh, and uh, in our engagements, which are going to increase as we progress with the electoral program, we want media to be able to promote the participation, for example, of women. You've been told you can't access media, you don't use WhatsApp, or if you go there, you'll be abused. You, don't, you can't go on a radio station, it's late in the night, you, you, you know. So how, how can media facilitate, offer convenient programming schedules, for example, uh, daytime programming, uh, or, or, or even if it's evening, it's not late night, which inconveniences uh, female candidates, for example. Uh, but also, uh, most importantly, to demystify the use of media in the elections. And, and this is what I want to, 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 to say. We have said that we are encouraging candidates to use what they have already been using. We are not creating something new. Candidates have been using posters to promote their candidature. J just take it to the next, you know, when we talk about media, mostly the, the, there's a thinking that it's about just broadcasting, but there's also publishing. 
uh, uh, they've been printing out posters, and posters show the candidate, their face, their image, their colors, their, their names. So that, that's good enough. Why don't we promote that? Um, flyers, flyers, we have been using them. Uh, and we are saying take them to the another level. Banners in that trading center, affordable, contactless. They, they do not bring so many people together, but they are constant, they are visible, they have good reach. And then we've talked about uh, uh, using media that we always use, uh, a, a radio announcement, a TV announcement where you can afford it, uh, a, a talk show on TV or radio, if you can afford that. Uh, SMS, SMS has been used before, uh, and uh, voice messaging, new digital media platforms, of course, like Twitter and, and the others. Uh, the purpose is that we work together to promote safe participation. I, I can participate, but safely. So the, the, at the center of this will be the media. Uh, we will say that we will not encourage or look for the story where the people have gathered. We will all try to drive them to gather people so that they show their numerical strength. I think that would be very critical. Uh, quickly, maybe you could also talk about uh, media as a platform for uh, political parties and candidates to communicate their message to the electorate. Uh, like Peter noted, you, when there is debate, the, the ideas are generated and uh, the, the, the issues are amplified and then perspective is formed and then someone can go and vote because they had one side and they had the other. And, and then she can make a choice out of that. So media can continue to do that. Uh, and like my, my colleague said, offering affordable rates so that you do not chase people away. Uh, if you do not af uh, provide affordable rates to aspiring candidates, then you are telling them to, to gather people together, which we have advised against. So I think media then will become a champion also in the battle uh, to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Uh, we've also uh, noted that uh, COVID is going to define how media safety in the electoral process is done, because now we also need to attend to media. Media safety has been about, uh, you know, other issues like protests and uh, violence, probably targeting them. But now there's uh, virus also targeting the media as well. So media participation in the electoral process also needs to focus on media safety. Uh, and, and for example, we have started looking at how many media persons can we invite to our press conference. Because as they come together, they form a big group. Uh, and uh, aren't we going against the very principle we've been talking about uh, of a few numbers. So there's need for media personnel to consider the nature of electoral activities and uh, the characteristic of COVID so that they don't just go out to follow the crowd just because you're following a story. I think that is very important. Um, well, now part as electoral commission working with the media council and other agencies and institutions like ACME will be doing uh, uh, media guidelines like we've already done relating to election reporting because we know media is going to report on the electoral process, mm -hmm. they're going to report on the campaigns. Uh, they're also going to report on polling day procedures, including the counting of results, the tallying of results, and the declaration of election can of, of candidates. So uh, there's a guideline coming up to that effect. But there's also media accreditation. We do media accreditation where we give media personnel uh, status so that they can reach polling stations and talk to our officials and talk to election observers and also access tele centers. So uh, the Electoral Commission considers the media to have a key role that uh, needs to be uh, uh, highlighted in this COVID environment. And that's where we're going with the media. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. Uh, Paul, um, there will be some questions, I'm hoping, online. And I'm, I, I'm opening this up because uh, when you return to the office, please take time to go on your social media platform and reply as many questions as possible. Mm -hmm. Because we don't have the time um, to take on the questions. And, and where we can, we will try with the Embassy of Sweden and uh, the different media platforms, UBC and uh, NTV, tag you in all these questions so you can at least engage as Electoral Commission, as UCC, and, and as, as Peter Moisinger. All right, so Peter, let me begin with you. Uh, and we have very few minutes before we wrap this up. Um, responsible journalism, and that's, that's what Abdu talked about. Uh, and, and, and indirectly, Paul, where he said, the media house can take it upon themselves to say any candidate that doesn't observe the standard operating procedures, that doesn't follow the guidelines, we will not cover. Um, is that something that we should be thinking about? Should we show that they are actually candidates breaking the law? Uh, uh, it's yes, absolutely. I yes. think uh, the media have uh, the responsibility to show us what is exactly going on. I'm not sure it is right to say they won't cover the person 
who is breaking you know the guidelines i think what they should do is to cover them but show they are actually breaking the guidelines that to go hand in hand i think and uh, expose them embarrass them hold them accountable basically uh, but of course i know that in any case uh, if you're talking about parliamentary candidates for instance there are way too many candidates for any media house in uganda to cover mm -hmm. You know, so you are going to mo most likely be selective, and I think Paul has mentioned a very good point about media safety. Do you really want to send your journalists to a rally uh, by a politician who is not respecting the rules at mm -hmm. all, mm -hmm. and you exposing your journalists to you know uh, a very high risk? So I think that uh, you, you have a responsibility to flag these issues. You could uh, perhaps uh, cover some of the message, but uh, above all, let's just be fair to all. You raised the question on the number of candidates, Peter, yeah. uh, and, and the number of categories of candidates. So you have the presidential, you have parliamentary, you have local government. Yeah. The question is, and a lot of us in the media are asking, who will get the lion's share of coverage? Who will actually get the coverage? So you will have probably a category of LC3 and, and will never get covered by the media because the big fish, the presidents or the presidential candidates and the members of parliament, are actually taking all the airtime. That and and how do you share the airtime? The airtime is not elastic. That, that's hard. That's a difficult one for the media. And uh, our previous m media monitoring reports have shown that uh, the presidential election, you know, got the, uh, you know, most of the coverage. And President Museven in particular, you know, took uh, most of the attention of, uh, of the media. However, upcountry uh, radio stations tend to actually cover parliamentary election far more than you guys who are based in Kampala, you know, NTV, NBS, Monitor, New Vision do. So there is, I mean, in some sense it evens out because of the presence of radio stations. The only challenge is that uh, radio stations up country rarely give the kind of context mm. we're talking about here. They cover issues, you know, in fleeting, I mean, they're like fleeting stories, you know, just uh, seven minutes for a news broadcast, you know, where they'll talk about uh, one or two issues, uh, pronouncements by candidates and so on you don't see the kind of analysis that is required for the media to really inform the public about what is at stake and you know how to make informed decisions finally mm. peter for you yeah um has been the question of um, you know skill and expertise in our yes. media newsrooms mm. uh, we have a very young newsroom in this country and that's been the biggest challenge um, that every single election year you almost have the majority of the journalists as first timers in an election yeah. doesn't that pose a big challenge especially now for a scientific election where we have to play a bigger role uh, it is a big challenge acme has been conducting training of uh, journalists on election coverage all over the country we started in uh, arua we've done kampala gulu um, Bali. we are proceeding to masaka and balala you know these are coming few days and uh, it is amazing i mean uh, the number of journalists who raise their hands when you ask whether you have covered an election. Very often in a group of 20, there are just about three who have covered an election, three or four. It is a very big challenge. I think uh, media houses need to do a lot more in terms of uh, inspiring, motivating uh, their troops to stay within the newsroom. There are so many challenges in those newsrooms and uh, this high attrition rate actually does affect the quality of journalism mm. and ultimately the kind of information that the mm. public gets from mm. the media. Mm. People who have covered elections for, you know, five or six elections have uh, such, you know, a memory that uh, is very useful in terms of uh, providing context, in terms of also networking, you know, in terms of uh, bringing different sources to, to the table. So uh, we hope that uh, we can begin to see more and more media houses attracting and motivating, you know, journalists who are experienced to stay within their newsroom. But there are some good examples, I think, right. uh, of that happening oh, in okay. some places. Uh, Abdu, very quickly, the, the question on uh, your new guidelines on uh, digital communication uh, or social media communication. Thank you very much, Maurice. These are not actually new guidelines per se. This was just a reminder. You know, the 2013 Act, the Uganda Communications Act, provides for what is called data communication. And it also defines broadcasting in a broad way to include any person that provides, that sends out message or content to many people, it's many people, and the message. I have presenters, I host people. 
these are the people we are targeting. We are not looking at individuals who have a small Facebook account, and once in a while you talk to your 20 people, your family members, we are looking for people who are in almost, I would call it formalized commercial broadcasting services mm, mm. using digital platforms. So right. the public should be guided that the purpose is not for you to, to limit anybody to use social media, right. but rather to ensure accountability yes. and responsibility so that we can protect the nation in case somebody misuses the platforms and maybe All right. we need to intervene. All right, we're going to take a very, very short break, very shortly, uh, but before we do that, uh, I want Abdu you to speak to the issue of penetration. A lot of candidates have been saying, um, <coughs> you want us to use uh, the media to communicate our messages, but there is areas, and I can mention, because I'm in this industry, northeastern Uganda, eastern parts of eastern Uganda because of the terrain, southwestern Uganda, where there's limited reach of radio and television, and the reach in terms of data, uh, I mean network, uh, t telephone network, uh, mm -hmm. internet, uh, is still relatively low in this country. For us to say social media is another pl platform uh, candidates can use, it's more urban and, and, and uh, city-based. So speak to the, the, those concerns by members of parliament and, and, and other candidates or aspirants who would like to use television and radio and how many people they're actually going to be able to reach. Thank you very much, Maurice. Maurice. Uh, at the moment, our statistics show that 97% of the land mass of Uganda has radio signals. The 321 radio stations are spread across the country. Not every district, but we have radio stations in towns like Jinja, but you find that radio station covers like eight districts. So we believe that with the existing radio stations, almost every part of this country can receive radio signals. You raised the point about northeastern and then also Karamoja area. Again, the reason is largely because of the setup, the natural setup, the terrain. Sometimes the radio stations on one side of the, of the mountain cannot properly spread beyond the mountain, yep. but we are working with the people in those respective areas, the broadcasters with licenses in those areas, to boost their signals such that they can overcome the technological and typological limitations for their signals to reach to the masses. But also, we're encouraging people to use, uh, for example, you can access your voters on the phone. You can send out messages to them. I know people say the cost of SMS is also high, but significantly, SMS, the cost of SMS has, has gone down. In terms of data availability and pricing, UCC at the moment is rolling out a new licensing framework for the telecommunication sector where we are encouraging and requiring all national operators to cover a minimum of 90% of Uganda. I'm glad to report that at the moment, most of our big operators are covering beyond 80% of mm. Uganda. Mm. Some of them are even reaching 90%. Mm. And uh, indeed, this is work in progress. Our aspiration is to see that the entire country is effectively uh, uh, covered, but also we are working with the operators to ensure that the cost of data goes down. And indeed, I need to challenge the public when you look at the cost of telecommunication services 20 years ago, let me say 10 years ago, you would call for 600 shillings per, per minute. But at the moment, people are allowing to call for 80 shillings, 100 shillings per minute. And this is not because other factors, I mean other factors of production, their prices have gone down, but because UCC, again in exercise of its mandate, continuously regulates the pricing models by the telecommunication companies to ensure that they do not overprice their services because at the end of the day we are looking at deepening connectivity yes. and bring many people on board thank you, uh, you there's something that you mentioned Very quickly, that yeah. i thought i could talk about uh, uh, the issue of uh, journalists and responsibility mm. you know in this conversation many times people say people think that the journalist we are talking to is the journalist who went to school and studied journalism and we've had a debate with my colleagues like Peter Moesije, who is a journalist. In this discussion, ladies and gentlemen, any person who holds out as a journalist, by your work, if you are doing work of a journalist, Morris, even if you didn't go to a school of journalism, if you are hosting shows, if you are reporting news, you are deemed to be a journalist mm -hmm. for that purpose. And therefore, you must comply with the professional code of ethics of journalists. We know that not many people find in journalism 
But whatever qualification you have, we are calling upon the practitioners themselves to look for knowledge, but also the owners of media houses to retrain their journalists, their reporters, their show hosts, and remind them of these fundamental rules on balancing responsibility, accountability, and uh, avoid being seen to be offside right. the rules and guidelines. Thank you very much, Abdu. I want to thank uh, Peter, uh, Paul, and Abdu for this very insightful discussion. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. You, you can uh, make your way. Our next panel will be coming in. Uh, I, I want to specifically thank uh, uh, Peter, Paul, and, and Abdu because they've set uh, the tone of this uh, dialogue. And uh, the next stage of this conversation will be focusing on social media conduct. We've spoken about uh, digital communication, but the detail will come into our next panel, social media conduct, uh, balancing media coverage, and uh, of course a perspective from um, the civil society uh, and, and also the media council on media regulations, ethics with journalism. We spoke about responsible journalism and uh, the technical perspective. Um, the conversation we are having. So, gentlemen, uh, feel free to take your seats, and uh, you're most welcome. If you're watching us and you're uh, you've just joined us, we're using the hashtag Democracy Talks UG. Uh, you can also uh, add the handles of UBC uh, TV Uganda, NTV Uganda, and uh, Embassy of Sweden in Uganda, uh, both on Facebook and on uh, Twitter. And you can also add uh, the tag for the Ministry of ICT and National Guidance, who are hosting us this morning here at the Information Center uh, in the city here, Kampala. So we want to welcome all of you who are joining us online and on air, and thanks for being with us for this conversation, this virtual dialogue on the role of the media in the electoral process during a pandemic. We have some of our panelists on Zoom who will be joining us via Zoom. So I will introduce those who are here, but I'll also introduce those joining us on Zoom, and our technical team will be uh, sharing that uh, group of people that are there. So one of our panelists, Awel Wihanganye, who is the head of the Government Citizen Interaction Center that sits here at the Ministry of ICT, uh, is joining us via Zoom, and uh, we'll be speaking shortly. But we also have Mr. Joseph Beyanga, who is uh, the re a representative from the National Association of Broadcasters, but is a radio practitioner with KFM, and uh, a representative of the Media Council. We have uh, Ms. Asumta Kemigisha uh, Sebunya, who will be talking to us shortly. And from the Editor's Guild, ladies and gentlemen, we have David Mukoli, who is Managing Editor at The New Vision. And uh, finally, my other boss, uh, the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of ICT, who will also be joining us via Zoom, um, Vicent Bajire, taking us through the technical perspectives. Uh, Awel, I want to begin with you, and I'm not so sure. If you can hear us, Awel, um, we've spoken quite a bit uh, maybe I just need to sh show that I can hear. Owl. Owl, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, Owl, we've been talking quite a bit on digital communication, and you had Abdu from the UCC uh, sharing some of their guidelines uh, with the digital communication. But there's been a lot um, of conversation on social media around uh, the uh, code of conduct, and we have an election coming up, or elections coming up next year, early next year. Um, you've been uh, one of the most active social media uh, personalities I know, and you've done quite a bit of work in this space. Um, share with us what would be the principles of communicating on social media during uh, an election. Uh, th thank you, Maurice, and uh, really good to be included on this panel. Um, I think uh, in terms of uh, the increasing role uh, social media is playing, which is uh, as a result of uh, increased um, uh, digital penetration, uh, or how citizens of Uganda are seeking out news um, and insights given the low uh, cost of data, but also self-penetration. You have a lot more citizens um, using social media as a way of finding news, but also engagement. Um, for example, in terms of numbers, you have almost 3 million Ugandans who are using so uh, Facebook um, or who are signed on Facebook. You have almost 400,000 Ugandans who are on Twitter. Um, but Twitter, though the numbers may seem low, uh, the numbers are actually um, very, um, it, it, Twitter is quite a very influential platform given the way it influences other spheres of media. 
in the last uh, NRM primaries, what we have learned is that I think right now the space for social media is still like largely not very well regulated and con and um, and uh, and guided. So one of the key responsibilities we are going to be embarking on is to make sure that the guidelines which are provided by UCC and uh, for us internally in government, the, the user policies which is developed by NITA under the Ministry of ICT is that we apply those guidelines and principles in engaging and educating citizens um, in terms of the responsible use of social media, um, particularly to make sure that we are minimizing the the spread and impact of fake news uh, on how people are receiving information. Um, also making sure that we uh, we, we keep a, a keep eye on how politicians are also using these platforms to organize, mobilize, um, and inform um, their, elect, their, their constituencies. But all in all, I think uh, Uganda as a country, I think is ready to, or has, the, has demonstrated capacity to, uh, to use social media as an effective way of mobilizing uh, the electorate and for uh, candidates to engage their their constituencies. So the key, the big part, the biggest test for us, I think, is going to be in a way that we put into uh, practice the guidelines and other uh, measures to minimize the spread of fake news, violence, um, <clears throat> and make sure also voter suppression is is also un, uh, minimized. All right. Um, I will uh, thank you. I'll, I'll probably come back to you if time allows again, because I wanted to talk about um, the unregulated space of social media and uh, how we can help with fact checking, especially with information that is being generated on social media. But I'll come back to you. I want to go to uh, Joseph Beyanga, uh, the balancing media coverage during elections. We've touched on this quite a bit with Peter uh, and he, he agrees it's going to be difficult for media houses, um, first of all, to provide airtime for the categories of uh, campaign campaigns, whether it's presidential, parliamentary, or local governments, but also um, the, the issue around what UCC and uh, Electoral Commission was saying, um, equal airtime, and also um, at least um, providing uh, enough time to all candidates to be able to share as much as they can and reach as many people as possible. What is NAB saying? Thank you very much, Maurice. Good morning once again to our viewers and uh, those who are following us online. Um, one thing that is for sure is uh, providing equal access to everyone is a challenge. And I actually wish uh, the uh, UCC and EC we are still here. Sometime back in June, we started working on the guidelines, which we are supposed to guide us towards that. And they consulted the Association of Broadcasters. We gave our input uh, up to date. We haven't seen them. and. Uh, EC is rolling out nominations very soon, so we don't know actually which rules we are going to be playing by. Uh, and, and in there, in the, in, the, in the at least what we input, we spend some time on equal access to all candidates. We spend some time on that. And, and what we are looking at is if we offer candidate X at rate Y, we should offer his competitors the same rate. I don't know if they've retained that in their, in their final input. Um, what, what was the motive? The motive is uh, there are guys who have lots of money and there are guys who have no money. But if it comes to advertising and somebody says, yes, I'm going to buy airtime, I want, I want this, we should offer you at least what fare your competitor took. That's the principle. But then also on the issue of access and, and, and everybody getting equitable access to media, there's one thing that is silent and, um, and, and I'd like to pick it out most specially experienced by upcountry broadcasters. RDCs in the name of government airtime. An RDC walks into a radio station where I hear they walk in unannounced most of the time, and they are asking for airtime, which the broadcasters committed some time back to the commission, that they will offer gov airtime to promote government programs. The airtime which is meant for promoting government programs end up being airtime for partisan politics. Mm. That's uh, and then that one definitely it would be an advantage to one group why it's a disadvantage to the competitors. That's another access that is being abused. Another, another form of access where you disable more candidates are not getting equitable access to, to, to radio stations. Is an opposition candidate 
it's very common with opposition candidates. They've bought their airtime, and they are denied access to the radio station. That is very common, very common up country. I mean, we've seen it in the media over and over again. So if we are looking at using media as a platform for people to do their campaigns, there has to be a commitment. There has to be good will to make sure it happens and it's equitable, it's available to all. Mm. Then the other issue under media for all is uh, the issue of balance, which uh, His Excellency the Ambassador, the Swedish Ambassador highlighted. There are many groups under that category, special interest groups, uh, the people with uh, disabilities and all that. When you look at the TV, at least we are trying. Uh, you find most of the major bulletins and all that have s somebody that doing sign language. But then what about those who are listening to radio? How are we making sure they access that? We will make the signal available as broadcasters. But what, so media will do, will make, even if we make the platform accessible to all, there has to be more efforts down the chain to make sure the media is actually accessible. Then um, uh, the other bit is, uh, is what also has already been highlighted, the, the, the press freedom space. It continues, uh, I've been around at least I've witnessed the last four elections, yeah, th this is my fourth or fifth, yes, uh, in the media. So every year, every election, you see the space is receding, slowly, slowly, slowly. And it comes in all forms. It comes in form of regulations, it comes in forms of, um, of security, implementing a curfew, you know, we, we've had m some people coming from from uh, radio and TV talk shows at 9 p.m., they are arrested. Others have to spend the night in the in the newsroom because they can't drive back home. So, if we are saying we have we have the pandemic with us, we have the curfew, but then people have to do campaigns. The guidelines were supposed to to define campaign time. They haven't defined it yet. Uh, we're still waiting. I don't know how we'll get to know all these details as we as we roll. So, for now, I I, I tell you the issue of access we committed to offer equitable access to all, but we need to remove these roadblocks mm. to make it mm. real. Mm. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, I, I'll come back to you, Joseph, on the issues around accurate, timely, and comprehensive coverage um, of matters election, um, because you, you literally will be at, at the center stage of uh, disseminating information during the campaigns. I, I want to go to uh, uh, David because um, this is related and allow me Frank to come to you last because um, you know the media council also will come in um, in terms of uh, the issues of um, responsible journalism uh, uh, David you know similar question um, and, and and this is uh, based on um, the, the conversation with the balancing of the conversation in in the media how are we going to effectively, and I'm speaking now as a media practitioner, how are media houses going to effectively uh, communicate um, and reach as many people as possible uh, this election year? Uh, because we are going to be the only platform available um, amidst other modes of communication uh, that can reach as many people as possible. And, and how would you advise uh, candidates and, 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 and politicians to uh, pick on these platforms and use it as a vehicle of communication? Uh, thank you, Maurice. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and could join in this conversation. Uh, the media actually is at the center of this election this year, and um, uh, it comes with uh, opportunities and challenges. But the media has to spread out and prepare and plan for this uh, election coverage. It's not like the previous uh, elections where you, you know, just have your teams run around from candidate to candidate and uh, file a story and the story is published or broadcast. Now it's going to be a little bit different. The media has to devise ways of one. How do you ensure, like uh, first speakers have said, your journalists are safe, you know, then also the journalists hold uh, the, the, the politicians accountable. Then also, what do you have that the politician can use? What platforms do you have in your media house so that a politician can ride on and communicate to the public, uh, or to the voter for that matter? So. What has happened with uh, over the past few years or past few months, we've seen media houses, especially the traditional ones, also expanding into digital, so that you will have a presence in digital. So if you have a presence in digital, the digital can feed into your traditional media, whether it's a radio or TV or a newspaper. So that way you, you can uh, leverage uh, the message of, of a politician 
and the pollution can reach so many people. So if you just stay with one platform, you will be a little bit constrained. You need a, a platform that is going to support the other. That's how you can reach out so many people across the country. Imagine you are just a radio station and you know radio station, uh, somebody said, I think UCC said they are about 321 and you are restricted into one area. You are operating in Soroti, but a politician goes on your radio station and has a message which is relevant to somebody in Kisoro, and how do they get to know? But if you had another channel, those people would get to know, and they will be following you. So the media houses should keep following each other to get to know what is on the other media house. And um, if they don't do that, then you can't effectively cover the, 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 the election. It will be interesting to see whether some media houses also consider sharing content at this time. So if I'm in Kisoro, you know, and I want to tap into a conversation which was in Soroti, you know, is the Soroti station going to give me that content, or am I going to buy it, or am I going to, to, to have it as an exchange so that they give me, and then one time I also have to give them some, some content. And then also, some people will argue that, but you see the, 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 the politicians have um, their media personality. But can I trust a message which is delivered from Soroti to Kisoro by a media uh, uh, expert over politician? Supposing it's distorted. So you see, we, there are all those concerns around that. So for me, I think media houses should have a little bit of multi-platform. They should invest in this election. And there are also opportunities. You are not just investing. You are investing, but there are also opportunities. Like Peter pointed out earlier, you know, there will be people running out for political advertising, there will be those opportunities. <coughs> but also there's the opportunity, the biggest opportunity I see for us as the media is to prove ourselves that we can be professional and inform the people to make a decision. Thank you very much, David. Uh, I want to come to you, Mr. Sumta, and the question around uh, media regulations, ethics um, within our journalism. Um, we spoke quite a bit on this in terms of responsible journalism, and you offer a platform where um, both the offender and offendee can come together and dialogue on a solution, uh, but also a platform where people can come and report um, uh, cases of sectarianism or misinformation that has been communicated as a, as a uh, on, on different platforms. I'm sure that's what the major guidelines will look like for an election, an election year like this or an election period like this. Uh, thank you very much. Um, good morning, viewers, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I just want to uh, inform uh, the public generally that the Media Council is actually set up by law, the Press and Journalists Act, and is indeed responsible for regulation of journalists. Uh, in light of what has been uh, spoken about, uh, there are quite a number of other regulations uh, and above all the Constitution of the Republic of Uganda. Uh, I have spoken about the, I've mentioned the Press and Journalists Act. Uh, we have the Penal Code Act. We also have the Access to Information Act. Uh, we also have the Regulation of Interception of Communication Act and the Anti-Pornography uh, Act. So under the Press and Journalists Act, uh, indeed we have set up uh, um, measures where, because we expect quite a number of complaints to come up during the electoral process, and uh, complaints by the public, an individual, the politicians, it could also be the government, it could be a, uh, a political party, uh, in relation to information that has been disseminated, inaccuracies therein. Uh, so we are working hand in hand with uh, UCC and uh, the, the, elect the Election Commission. Indeed, we have been engaging in quite a number of things. So, but really what, what really uh, the, the journalists out there need to know is that for their reporting or for their work to be done, it has indeed to remain within the realms of their professional uh, code of ethics. 
And I think w uh, for as long as that is done, then even out there to the public, they will get the right information, which will also help them make the right decisions, especially during such a time. Um, I don't know, maybe for all now. All right, okay, uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I am happy for the sound bite. Uh, it's perfect for me because you give me more time to ask as many questions. Joseph, before I come to Frank and, and my peers, yes, Joseph, quickly. You know, uh, I expected my colleague uh, Asanta to, to, to mention that at least, you know, finally, given that there's so much attention on the media, that we are going to set up the media tribunal, which UCC Act of 2013 talks about. You know, wh where we are seeing so many conflicts arising from the different rallies, this time they're becoming about what has been broadcasted on different platforms. So if we are really serious about this, I expect the president tomorrow to announce that the UCC right. tribunal has been set up. Oh, Otherwise, I, I hear you, Joseph. Uh, I think the PS is also watching and he's going to be available. I, I want to protect Asumta a bit because this was a question for Abdu, and Abdu should have taken this question. But Asumta, I'm happy for you to take on the Thank question. You. Do you want to say something? Yes. Um, just for information, we have made this proposal. We have engaged with uh, UCC. We have also engaged with uh, the Election Commission. And uh, like we have said, uh, it is in progress. And I'm hoping that it can be done as fast as possible because indeed with what is, what is expected to happen, we see quite a number of complaints that will come in. And then again, you don't want that complaint to be handled after mm. uh, <laughs> the, 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 the event, you know. So that we indeed we hope that this tribunal will be quickly set up for quick handling or efficiency. All right. Yes. All right. Frank, let me come to you. Uh, and I need to introduce Frank. He's the executive secretary of IPOT um, and also country representative of the Netherlands Institute for Multi-Party Democracy. Um, Frank, uh, you, uh, in the previous election and, and even now in the run-up to the election, you had lots of dialogues uh, between the different political organizations. And here we are. Uh, amidst this pandemic, and those conversations at iPod level started even before the, the pandemic. Here we are in a pandemic, we're going into an election where your political organizations and the different political parties will be seeking for equal airtime and a voice on these media platforms. Is, is there some concerns for you? Uh, thank you so much, Maurice, and I'd like to first of all thank uh, the Swedish Embassy and the Minister of ICT for this very important conversation coming in at a very timely uh, period. Uh, good morning, viewers, and uh, all those who are listening to us on social media. Maurice, the first thing I'd like to point out is the fact that this is a unique election. We have had elections in the past that have had challenges, but here is an election going to take place in COVID times where everybody is concerned about health, both the government and people in opposition are all concerned about the health of our people, the voters. But at the same time, it is needs to be pointed out that this is a high stakes election. Mm. The stakes are really high. Those of you who have been following the NRN primaries can see this is a, our unfortunately our politics is more increasingly becoming a zero sum game. It's a do or die. Uh, this could be having a range of reasons from the electoral system and other things the political system and others. But it's a high-stakes game. It is a high-stakes game also because we have new players. We have got Bobby Wine coming on too with his youthful energy. Uh, Noop is in. We are seeing new players like Alliance for National Transformation, independent actors like General Tumukunde and others. Tumwini. And uh, <laughs> General... Tumkunde, sorry, yes. I'm right. No, they, they both confused. Okay, <laughs> Tumkunde. Okay. Say, yes. I thought you were giving me no, a No, no, no. <laughs> Okay, but then another, it's also important to know, and this the media needs to take seriously, and the regulators, that politics is about connecting. Connecting politicians with voters, and nobody is going to take a second, somebody, nobody is going to take that lightly. Mm. So if we cannot meet with voters because of COVID-19 restrictions, then the media will have to play a very big role to create another avenue. Because if that avenue is not created, we are going to be forced, it is going to be a very tall order to enforce the regulations. I also need to point out that this election is going to have about one million elective positions. 
Even if you have to use an average of four candidates per election, we are talking about a possibility of five million candidates. Basically, 25% of the electorate in Uganda are running for president. <laughs> that in itself is a crisis. Now, media becomes very critical. Critical in terms of making sure this election is issue-based. Critical in terms of fair access to the radio stations. We've already been having a lot of conversations within the iPod structures at the highest possible levels with the Electoral Commission and other actors. The media this time around, like uh, the executive director of ACME was saying, it has a big role of directing the population to an issue-based political campaign. Mm. We need to move to the issues. This country has very many issues, and the population is going to be guided by you now who are in the driver's seat. So the questions of fairness, questions of access. Now on access, I was having a small conversation with the ED of UCC. I mean, you're talking about these regulations. I have heard many people allude to regulations in this talk. And I'm wondering what regulations we're talking about. Because these regulations, we have heard about them in the media, but we need to see them. They need to be disseminated. Political leaders need to know these regulations from the top to the bottom. We need to be speaking about them all the time so that we can actually engage with them and see how to fit within the, these regulations. The cost of media is not a something to just uh, take lightly. I, I understand the media houses through NAB have managed to uh, break down the cost to by 40%, I'm told. But I think the, this is the time the, our friends in the media need to show a bit of social corporate responsibility by allowing your platforms to be used as pla uh, to be used to give the alternative campaign manifesto platforms of the various political parties. The practicalities of it, given the numbers, I know is a, a tall order, but we can have more conversations on that. I also think that uh, critically, another role that the media can play is to mobilize the population to participate constructively. There is a serious risk of possible violence. Anybody who has been watching the NRM primaries closely realizes that if we are not very ethical and professional in the way we are going to conduct and manage this whole process, we could easily spill out into many problems. So there is a big duty beyond just the accuracy, the professionalism. There is a, there's a call for the editors to exercise editorial policy, editorial jurisdiction, to make sure that we look out for fairness so that we do not get our population completely uh, in trouble. But let me say this as I conclude, uh, Maurice, that I understand that it's one thing to have laws, good laws. It's another thing to enforce them. Uh, I, uh, a brother here was saying earlier that some journalists are going to be fearing for their jobs. Will they keep their jobs even as they enforce what is in the laws? So there is need also for political goodwill. Mm. And this is where iPod comes in. Because we say in as much as we appreciate uh, good laws, we also realize that good laws uh, need the context of political goodwill. And iPod is really about political goodwill. We are speaking to leaders in the ruling party, leaders in the opposition, to put Uganda first, to realize that this election will come and go, but this country shall stay. So it is important that even the, uh, the power holders uh, exercise goodwill, and this means bringing the police and other law enforcement agencies in the loop be to support the work of UCCE, the regulation, and the EC. So therefore, I'm saying that this is going to be a multi-stakeholder engagement, and I'm glad we're having this kind of conversation so that all of us can come together and support the media and support ourselves to see a good electoral process. I'll end it there. Thank then. you very much, Frank. Uh, Frank, if I find some time, I want to come back on how NAB and iPod can collaborate uh, to agree on uh, a set, uh, on a code of conduct um, so that if it's, it's, it's broken, then the media has a responsibility to withdraw uh, the, its platform to a particular candidate or at least mention the fact that that candidate is breaching the set agreed uh, code of conduct. I want to bring in the Permanent Secretary Minister of ICT, uh, Vincent Bajire. Uh, uh, P.S. if you can hear me, please say something. Uh, Buena P.S. can Hi. you hear me? Hi, Maurice, I can hear you. Oh yes, uh, we'll increase the volume here so everyone can hear you. Uh, P.S., you've been uh, at the lead of shaping uh, the guidelines, um, especially under your sector. Uh, the issues around access to media, equality, collaboration, and regulation. You want to take us through some of the technical perspectives, P.S.? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maurice. Uh, thank you, colleagues, uh, and everybody who has made a contribution uh, to this dialogue. Uh, indeed, it is true. That uh, the ministry working with our agency, the Uganda Communications Commission, 
and the electoral commission have developed some comprehensive guidelines. It is unfortunate they have not been shared yet, but um, all the issues that were raised by now were assessed, and I think by and large, much of it has been incorporated. Having said that, we did not want to have uncoordinated movement of troops where the Ministry of IT issues guidelines on a matter that is related to elections. So what we have done is uh, repair those guidelines and pass them on to the Electoral Commission. And uh, we are hoping that uh, the Electoral Commission will do the needful and communicate those regulations to whoever is concerned. But just to allay uh, any fear, uh, these uh, uh, guidelines are uh, quite detailed to the extent that we prescribe what we expect of a uh, media owner. So much so that if he is a politician and he owns a platform, we are prescribed what we expect uh, in terms of a host with your opponent, what should happen. We have uh, prescribed the code of conduct during the election for all the presenters, DJs, whoever will be on air, and uh, we use both the law and the regulations to ensure that we hold media owners accountable to everything that we say during the election. And the purpose for this is to ensure that their integrity that uh, uh, Dr. Peter Monsuri was talking about. Indeed, uh, uh, somebody mentioned the need for the need for the communication tribunal. And uh, I want to say that uh, from the ministry's viewpoint, we've done everything possible to make sure that the tribunal is set up. We just await uh, our colleagues at the Judicial Service Commission to propose the judge as required by law, the head of the tribunal must be a person qualified to be a judge in accordance with the law. But we all know that uh, we've had challenges of uh, judges even in our mainstream courts. But we are waiting, we are hopeful, we've given all the documentation that was required by the Judicial Service Commission. So we are confident that uh, sooner than later, shall have that tribunal set up. That tribunal will assist us in addressing all issues that are related or all uh, matters related to communications. But in saying that, even in the absence of the tribunal, it does not take away the right of any other party to pursue a matter in the course of law. So that avenue is still open. So we are hoping that uh, 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 anybody in the average Thank you very much, Buona. P.S. Do stay with us just in case a couple of more questions come in. Um, I want to return to you, uh, our panelists, because there is a couple of uh, pending issues, and I remember I want to begin with you, Joseph, uh, because there is the issue of cost. And, uh, you know, um, Frank has mentioned uh, the reduction in cost for the politicians to access the different media houses, but that is again uh, something the UCC was mentioning. You cannot set a price for one candidate and have a different price for another candidate. But secondly, we also know that he who pays the piper uh, plays the tune. You know that. And so the question on how are you going to be able to be objective, not to offer more airtime to somebody who's actually giving you more money um, for advertising. on our platforms, we have two categories of content. There's what we call editorial content. That's the news and the talk shows and all that. On those platforms, what we are, stri what we are communicating to our members and what all media houses are striving to do is to ensure there's accurate and balanced content presented in the most fair manner. Now, when it comes to the second category of content, which is paid for content, these are these when somebody buys airtime to come and appear on a talk show. Buying airtime is your ticket, mm -hmm. but while you are on the platform, you are governed by the rules and regulations which the PS has just mentioned. So that one, you will not get one candidate coming to make all, false, all sorts of false accusations and all that because you paid airtime. <laughs> when you are in a platform, you are governed by certain conditions. 
as they normally say, management res reserves the right. Of <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so because you know, because you paid air for airtime, it doesn't take the responsibility away from the broadcaster. We are still responsible. We will moderate and make sure it's an issue-based campaign, as Frank had hinted on that. We will look out for the issues. It's not a p we are not looking at setting up platforms for people to use them to make personal accusations and personal attacks. And then on the issue of the cost, we've had a lot of engagements with the different media houses and we've appealed to each one of them to come up with their red cards for, for elections. And the communication we received the last time we engaged, people are offering the best rate possible. So we are not looking at a situation where we say, this is our time to kill him. This is not a time to cash in. This is a time to offer a platform for, a, for the nation to make decisions and pick leaders who will govern us. This is not an EC election. It's not an NRM election. It's a Uganda election. Uh, you, you could you know, have a continuation on what Joseph was saying, but for me, I liked when you talked about uh, the conversation on collaboration. I, I mean, for me, let's begin there. There is no single media house that is going to be able, for example, to have uh, every uh, representation at every village, or le let's even say sub-county. Now, uh, how we get timely uh, and, uh, information from the grassroots will be very critical in providing uh, information to our people. You want to speak to that and why collaboration is going to be very key in this uh, election, this scientific election? Previous elections, we had uh, the candidates uh, moving around, going from uh, rally to rally, and they would go to points where you have an, uh, uh, a reporter, or even some of the, especially the presidential candidates, will go along with uh, a media crew. A team, various media houses would contribute team uh, members to be on that crew. And you would get timely information, you would have somebody filing from the field, and, but now it's not anymore. So people have to use the radio station. So how do they engage? How do I know where, what candidate has said what? So that begins to inform the need for collaboration. How do you tap in? How do you work together? Because again, also it brings us an opportunity for, can we develop a crew of uh, citizen journalists? Mm. So who can be scattered across the country so that these are linked to media houses and they'll provide us timely information. Now, citizens journalists would need, we can go for all people who have retired, people who are like teachers, those are responsible people who we can tap in and they send us information which we can communicate. Without that, we will not be serving the public a lot because we, there will be a missing link. How do I get to a place where I don't have a reporter, where there's even poor communication, so how do you take this information of this candidate across the country? Mm -hmm. So that's a very big challenge that the media house has to begin talking about mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. I know it's coming a little bit late, but like at Vision Group where I work, we've put in place 460 journalists to cover the elections, but that is not enough. You know, that's not enough. They can't be spread across the country. So we, ca we can only support them now with, uh, wi with citizen journalists and also with with the uh, media houses that we can cooperate with, mm, mm, you know, mm. collaborate and see how content can be shared, what is it, will it be paid for, or, you know, so, so there has to be a mechanism put in place for us to reach the whole country, oh. for fairness, yes. for balance, for objectivity, this has to be done. All right, thank you. Um, Awel, I want to come to you, and Awel, if you can hear me, uh, when you were closing, I did mention uh, the issue around... Uh, uh, fact-checking a lot of this information that will be shared on social media and how we can actually um, work within the guidelines to regulate the information that will be shared on social media. Awel? Yeah, th thank you, Morris. Um, I think, uh, li like I said earlier, I think this is going to be one of the, the biggest challenges that we'll face during this election, um, given the misuse of social and digital platforms for spreading propaganda and and false news. So working with collaboratively with UCC, which has uh, more enhanced capacities and, and mandates to, uh, to do this, we'll be coordinating with uh, UCC and supporting uh, the Electoral Commission in making sure, first of all, that accurate and the right information 
on uh, the electoral processes is reaching where the people it should be reaching on social media platforms and digital platforms. Um, but then the other thing is also to make sure that in the monitoring framework, which we are putting in place at the moment, uh, in making sure we track negative uh, coverage of uh, negative engagement of some of the elements or uh, abusing social media. So fact checking and uh, tracking uh, abuse of, uh, of social media platforms is, um, is part of the guidelines that uh, the Department of Social referred to, um, in which we are going to be very actively involved in, uh, as the government system interaction center, but collaborating with different other agencies and ministries of government. But I'll also say in, term, in the context of other aspects of citizen engagement during this election, um, some of the things that the panelists were referring to, like for example, equalization to um, access to, 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 to voters. I think social media, as we know, is like the equalizer. So I think the, like we've seen during the NRM primaries, um, those, some of the key uh, resources which are online, which some of the candidates are utilized as a way of connecting to mainstream media to get their messages across. Um, those who are effectively doing that, I think, got an advantage. One of the other advantages they use the digital and social media platforms to support their campaigns was uh, monitoring the, uh, the, the vote counts and relaying some of their own information to their centers um, and also putting this information out in time to minimize like uh, the voter fraud and, and, and all that. So I think so for candidates, I think social media and digital platforms are going to be just as critical as mainstream media. Um, and the good thing is that all the media houses, the key media houses who are also providing um, this open access to for candidates also are deploying the same uh, platform as they were putting out information and reaching out to citizens. So our role really is to proactively work with the main players in making sure that access for candidates or use of this platform is just as equitable um, as the other in support of the Electoral Commission and the ECC. All right, thank you very much. Uh, lady and gentlemen, I really want to apologize. I've run out of time. This conversation could have continued, and I think these dialogue talks, um, His Excellency the Ambassador is here, uh, Daniel from the Embassy. Uh, we will request for more of these so we can continue this discussion in the coming days. We want to thank you. Our panelists, please do uh, make your way as we begin the process of closing this dialogue. And we want to thank you all on uh, social media and uh, on uh, watching us live on TV and our partners NTV and UBC. We want to also thank the Ministry of ICT that are putting this together with the Embassy of Sweden here in Uganda. So I want to welcome uh, the Honorable Minister and uh, the Ambassador to take their seats. And uh, very shortly, they will be guiding us through uh, the closing remarks. And at the tail end, we'll also have a very short video that we'll play for you as we wrap this conversation. So tonight, uh, today, I am actually hearing uh, great conversations on the role of the media um, in this electoral process during a pandemic. And it's quite interesting when you hear um, uh, the fact that the media will have to provide uh, timely, accurate, and comprehensive information um, to our voters, but also the use and uptake in the use of technology, as mentioned by all the speakers here uh, this morning. So allow me, ladies and gentlemen, uh, begin with a vote of thanks that will be made by His Excellency Par Lingard, uh, the Ambassador of Sweden to Uganda. You're most welcome, Your Excellency. Let me start by uh, thanking uh, the Ministry of uh, ICT and National Guidance and, uh, of course, the Minister herself for uh, embracing this uh, initiative and for successfully organizing uh, this uh, dialogue. We look forward to uh, continued partnerships in this and uh, many other areas of uh, mutual interest. I would also like to thank today's uh, panelists for engaging us in uh, fruitful uh, discussions on, on how the media role is critical to Uganda's de democracy.
this discussion have uh, taken us from the um, importance of having a code of conduct for election reporting to ensuring balanced reporting in order to level the playing field for political players. We also uh, touch, touched on the important role social media plays in elections and how to ensure ethics are maintained in uh, journalism. And maybe, maybe just here uh, I would like to add um, regarding balanced uh, reporting and uh, just one uh, piece of um, information from um, Sweden. Uh, just to mention that in Sweden uh, um, the public service media is actually funded through uh, lic license fees paid by Swedish households. And uh, the public service media is uh, led by a special board and uh, its uh, members uh, are nominated by the um, political parties represented in the parliament. And I, th I think that's one way to, to um, safeguard equitable coverage and uh, non-biased um, reporting on um, political issues. I believe we have had um, successful discussions. However, this should not end today. The election period has only just started. So this uh, should be just the beginning of uh, such discussions. I hope that uh, six months from now we can look back and reassess ourselves to see whether the media played its role as an impartial source of information and a watchdog and a defender of democracy as it influences public opinion. It's good to note that the government, that the government has set up uh, a government citizens interaction center to facilitate citizen access to government information. I hope this will increase citizen participation, transparency, accountability and open governance. I look forward to continued engagement with you all as we ensure that democracy continues to grow in Uganda. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, those of you watching online, please note that the, the reason there is no hand claps is that we are literally in this room alone. And so it's a virtual dialogue. And do not question why we are not getting uh, hands of applause for our guests. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, allow me to m invite uh, uh, the Honourable Minister of uh, ICT and National Guidance uh, to make closing remarks. The Honourable Judith Nabokova. Uh, thank you, the moderator. And I want to thank all the participants who have ably articulated issues on the media and democracy. Allow me thank Your Excellency the Ambassador for having arranged this dialogue and we are looking forward to more engagements. For those of you who have been following us, at least I've been listening in virtually, but I've liked the deliberations from the different panelists. They seemed experienced and also knowledgeable of what they are speaking about. I pray that the media out there will walk the talk. Let, let it not remain in this room, but I pray that everyone practices what we usually speak, because it will be the only way toward delivering a peaceful and a good election come 2021. And I also have noticed that all stakeholders are in agreement that this time round, the media is going to play a very crucial role in the general elections. Of course, there are a number of challenges here and there, because this is the first time as a country 
we are organizing elections in that manner. But I believe that together we can address those challenges. There are challenges of equal airtime to candidates. We've heard about also issues of the special interest groups. Will they be in position to address their issues on the media? We have also had issues of who will be arbitrating in case of conflicts. But we know that right now, UCC and Media Council can ably do that role. And I would also believe that through engagements and also sensitizations of the journalists by UCC and Media Council will be in position to address most of our fears. So I pray that we continue working together. We can always organize future dialogues, bringing together all the stakeholders to listen and share views from the media, but also from the outside world regarding the progress of the elections come 2021. And as a ministry, we have been working closely with the Electoral Commission of Uganda. I had the, uh, the PS talk about the guidelines that were developed. We did our work as a ministry. We handed over the guidelines to the Electoral Commission. And we believe Electoral Commission, at an appropriate time, will come out to elaborate on those key guidelines that were developed by the ministry of ICT. The success of the forthcoming elections squarely depends on the way the media will choose to behave. If you choose to behave unprofessionally, then we might be doomed for something else. But if you believe that you can deliver and pass the test, then it is the time for you to act professionally, objectively, and manage the respective candidates whom you will be hosting in your TV stations and radio stations. Of course, world over, there is a challenge of fake news on social media. And it is still a challenge here in Uganda. And what I've noticed, most of the social media users <coughs> may not have the journalistic kind of training. So it will still pose a challenge. And we know very well that right now, social media sets the agenda. You'll find that the traditional media picks clues or leads from the social media, and then they follow up to verify and see how they can build on what has been presented via social media. But we believe that through constant engagement with the users, we shall be in position to get where we want. But I would also call upon members of the public to behave responsibly as far as using the social media platforms is concerned. We usually see messages that, that are not good attacks. You know, somebody inciting, at times vulgar language being used on social media. Yet, that tweet or audio is intended for a public consumption without even discriminating who is going to receive that message. So it ends up maybe, it ends up spoiling the, the entire meaning of communication. I would request members of the public that please at least try to follow the minimum broadcasting standards. Culturally, we know very well that we are brought up to be disciplined as individuals. And we expect the same to be done when communicating, especially with other people whom you even don't know what their response would be in one way or another. As I conclude, I encourage the media to choose being objective always as we work towards a peaceful elections come 2021. I once again thank the ambassador for this dialogue. I want to thank the moderator the PS, Minister of ICT and National Guidance with your team, I want to thank UBC and NTV for having enabled us reach a wider view virtually. So we are grateful as a ministry and we shall continue doing what we have done to reach out to a number of 
media houses, but also a wider public, maybe at regional levels to enable them also participate and understand what we are looking up to. For God and my country, thank you once again.